Um, I'm Pastor John Edis, and uh, my last name is spelled with a J, but it sounds like a Y. Uh, my name was Isaac, but then you'd have Pastor Judas, which doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> so I go by Pastor John, which is much simpler. And when I started out in the ministry, I was pretty young, and most of my congregation was pretty old. And so I uh, thought that was a way to show them deference as well. They were certainly my elders in many ways. And so Pastor John was a way to combine the, you know, the office of the pastor with the respect for them. Um, I've been teaching classes in the lay leadership training program in our district for about 16 years. Um, and uh, occasionally, once or twice a year, we have some uh, huddles that is gathered together people who are part of our classes in order to have continuing education or uh, interaction. Um, I was able to be at one meeting with the chairman of the uh, task force that produced this report, Larry Vogel, when he was in town about a year ago. And uh, Victoria and some other people were at that, perhaps some of you were as well. So that gave me a little sense of where that was going. Well, I'll give you a, an overview of what's in the report and then a lot of observations on that. Basically, the report is in response to a problem, you might say, or is it a blessing? Which is, uh, there are unordained men serving in some kind of pa pastoral capacity, and so uh, many of them are preaching or consecrating the sacraments. This is very often in churches that are in remote places or um, urban or ethnic uh, congregations or perhaps large congregations in which a pastor isn't able to uh, cover all the bases himself, or perhaps in congregations where the pastor has some kind of uh, handicap that restricts him. Um, so the concern is, what do we do about these uh, people who are not clergy, who are serving basically in a pastoral capacity? Now there's some uh, answers to that question. Uh, one of the answers to it is basically to ignore it and, and hope that would uh, go away. Another answer to that question was to criticize it, and certainly many people, especially who held an especially high view of the pastoral office, uh, think that's offensive. Um, the response of our district has been to train laymen to be deacons, our lay leadership training program, and that's true of other uh, districts as well. Our district also uh, gives credentials and oversees the ministry of particular um, uh, of men that are, are serving. As the task force response, which is basically to um, require some seminary training and to eliminate those who aren't a part of, uh, aren't actually clergy. And so that would uh, eliminate any kind of ministry in a pastoral capacity uh, by people who are not clergy. Now, as far as the recent history of the Missouri Synod goes, um, in 1989, this was extensively discussed prior to and during the convention. Um, the convention then approved the idea that the districts, individual districts, could train people for word and sacrament ministry and that districts could license people who they would call deacons to do this kind of ministry. Now that wasn't universally accepted in the Synod, and so in every national convention since then, the resolutions have come out in favor and against uh, licensed deacons doing this kind of ministry. And so uh, as part of my classes, I usually photocopy those uh, worksheets from the workbook and we look at their rationale behind those. There's been training in about uh, 10 or 12 districts in the country of the 35 districts uh, that do train people as our district does and this summer two districts said that they wanted to add to that program, uh, add pro that program to their own district. It was uh, this year then that the Missouri Synod Task Force then recommended that deacons be terminated, and their recommendations will go to the convention next year in July uh, for assessment. Now, the task force conclusions are not complete or definite, okay? 
Uh, those are just recommendations. And so the convention itself decides whether to accept and enforce those or not. So we're part of the discussion about whether those recommendations uh, should be accepted. Now the task force recommends these things. <laughs> yes, you'll be terminated. The task force recommends no new deacons after January 1st, 2018. That's two years from now. Uh, the position of deacon will be terminated as well at that time. There'll be no new deacons and all old deacons will be terminated. And there'll be no deacons on the face of the earth, at least as far as the Missouri Senate is concerned. Um, they also recommend that the lay leadership training programs in different districts continue, including ours, but that there should be no training and no view towards a credential at, as a deacon at the end of that series. And so what that washes down to is only people who have been ordained after seminary training will be able to preach or do pastoral work. I'd like to give you some of my uh, observations about this. The report completely ignores the fact that the deacon is a biblical office. Now in 1 Timothy 3, there are qualifications for a deacon that follow exactly on the heels of qualifications for bishop. Um, deacons are also mentioned with other church offices in Philippians 1. However, if you look you will have to read the report very closely to find any reference to the biblical office of deacons in the report. I found about nine lines in the 30-page single-spaced report that actually talked about uh, deacons from a biblical perspective. One of those uh, was in a footnote, and pretty much all of them were slanted negatively against that. Uh, but we're talking about deacons, right? Isn't this report supposed to talk about deacons? It does, however, devote 120 lines to evangelist assistant, which, of course, uh, we've never thought about adding uh, to uh, the Synod uh, stable of offices, and isn't a biblical office either. Um, the Synod does have a number of non-biblical auxiliary offices. Uh, however, the task force doesn't at all even raise the idea that deacon could be an auxiliary office in the Senate. Um, and they, uh, one thing I'd have to add to that is, in, in my experience, as I've seen people who were uh, deacons or go through the lay training, you know, they really see deacon as a calling. And they don't see themselves as being called to the office of evangelist assistant. So this is, I think, a, a, a major gap in this report, uh, because the districts who are licensing deacons very much see this as a biblical office. And so not, to, not even to deal with it seriously in the report, I think, is a big gap. There's another part of the report that struck me, and that is that um, it says that we should not have an elitist view of pastors, and yet the district uh, or I'm sorry, the task force report does really promote a very elitist view of pastors and it really denigrates deacons at the same time. It does this mostly through terminology. The most common terminology for clergy in the report is the office of the holy ministry in all capital letters and the office of preaching in all capital letters. Uh, where in the Bible do you find those two terms? Nowhere. You don't. You don't find either of those. It also uses the term lay deacon. Do you find that uh, title in the, in the Bible? How about um, license? How about layman serving pastoral ministry? How about mercy diaconal work uh, being attached to deacons? None of those, right? Um, if you look at 1 Timothy 3, of course, it talks about qualifications for uh, deacons and qualifications for uh, bishops. Um, you notice that it doesn't say lay deacon and it doesn't say lay bishop and so it would be as accurate to say lay deacon as it would be to say lay bishop based on that verse. So clearly as though even though there's a, a formal 
uh, statement that says we're not making an elitist view of pastors and we're respecting deacons. Really, the opposite is true, especially in the terminology that's in this report. Now, this is a really key issue in the report, and that is it claims that because the wider church doesn't certify deacons, therefore we shouldn't have them. They say deacons are only certified in local churches, and so that doesn't count. Okay, well, think about that a moment. Uh, and think especially about the ways in which the wider church does certify deacons in different ways. One of them, of course, the most obvious is that the Synod proposal back in 1989 uh, had the National Synod approving the program of training, credentialing, licensing, training, credentialing, licensing, and reviewing the licenses of deacons. This is the whole city of the convention who directed districts to do this. That's the wider church um, certifying them. It's also to be noted that when, before someone is um, credential as a deacon in our district, they are interviewed by officers of synod. So the officers of synod, mostly the district president and the vice presidents are those who are on that committee. Um, when someone leaves the seminary as a seminarian, are they interviewed by officers of synod? No. They're interviewed by employees of synod, uh, professors and people on staff, not officers, generally speaking. The wider church also credits or certifies deacons in that uh, one district pretty much informally uh, recognizes the training of deacons that's done in other districts. I'd like you to think about how the wider church uses deacons compared to other auxiliary offices. Okay, you tell me what these statistics mean. There's 525 certified deacons presently. There's 617 DCEs, Directors of Christian Education in the country. That's one of the official auxiliary offices. There's another set of a half dozen official auxiliary offices in the Senate including the Director of Parish Music, Director of Outreach, um, Parish Assistant, uh, Deaconess, and so forth. If you add up all of the people who are certified in all of those auxiliary offices and add them together, you've got 448. In other words, there are more deacons than there are all of those auxiliary offices combined other than DCE. Which means you are a lot more likely, as a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, to be served by or to have ordained a deacon in your church than any of these other offices. Currently, 10 districts train deacons, but you can find deacons preaching in 27 districts in the country. Think about that. 10 districts train them, but they exist in 27 districts. That means we and other uh, districts are training deacons. They're going to districts that do not have deacons, and they are serving there. I mean, in an acceptable way, you know, with the permission of the district president there. Which means there are district presidents that are acknowledging the training of deacons and their ministry in a preaching office. 20 of the districts in our synod, 20 out of the 35, also have deacons in them who preach and consecrate communion and have bapt and baptize. So again, you know, these are uh, about 55% of the districts in synod have deacons who preach and do the sacraments, and 27 of them, that's about 75%, have deacons who are active in preaching. So what that means is, Deacons are widely accepted in the wider church in a lot of ways, and this is a really, a really critical point to remember. Another observation I had in this uh, thing is that when they describe the proper call of a pastor, they describe three things in there. Examination, call by a congregation, and ordination. Those of you who are deacons, you remember those three things were part of your training, weren't they? You had the training in the classes, you had an uh, interview in front of the officers of synod, and then there was an ordination or commissioning in your service. And so uh, the same kinds of things that set apart uh, pastors for an office are what set apart 
view is uh, deacons in that office. Now, the synod tends to distinguish between ordaining, meaning that's clergy, and commissioning, meaning those are um, uh, non-clergy. You don't see that distinction in the New Testament. The New Testament uses a few different words for appoint, ordain, choose, set apart, and they're used quite fluidly. Uh, there's no rule in the New Testament about, oh, gee, you can only use ordain for a uh, bishop, but you can only use commission for um, uh, an elder. Uh, there's not that kind of thing. So on the whole, what you find is that uh, the uh, LCMS practice is more based on historical use in the synod and ecclesiastical use and administrative use and even uh, IRS use rather than biblical use. And this is an important uh, uh, failure, I think, on the part of the um, the uh, task forces report. This is another critical um, point in the task force report, which is that um, they downplay pastors doing oversight of deacons. And so they say, well, really, it talks about pastors overseeing anyone only four times in the New Testament. Therefore, they shouldn't be doing that much of that. So we shouldn't have deacons because it's only mentioned four times. Okay, now let's think about that. So that means if something is said less than five times, then we shouldn't do this, right? Okay. Um, how many times does it actually say that pastors should consecrate the Lord's Supper in the New Testament? Zero. Now, consecrating a sacrament, of course, is mentioned, but it's never said that pastors should do this. And so does that mean they shouldn't? Okay. So, you know, it's a, it's a rather poor argument, uh, for sure, that, you know, there's some sort of magic number. And certainly, uh, if you ask the task force, well, should the pastor oversee his DCE, or his parish ministry assistant? The, uh, the task force certainly wouldn't say that because oversight is only mentioned four times, then pastors shouldn't oversee day school teachers, or shouldn't oversee DCEs, or shouldn't oversee elders or Sunday school teachers. You know, so, uh, gee, where did this argument come from? Uh, it doesn't make sense biblically or even rationally. The report also says that uh, there's been more confusion and disorder in the Synod since licensed deacons <coughs> began to be used in 1989. I would say exactly the opposite is true. See, the purpose of the 1989 resolution was to add order to what was happening. What they were seeing is that lots of churches and lots of places were having untrained, non-clergy lead the services. And so we needed to add order to that by giving them training and by credentialing them and by renewing their licenses and having direct oversight by a local pastor and then indirect oversight by the district president. And so the lay training and the credentialing of deacons actually added order to what was going on in the Synod. And really, if you compare the training programs across the different districts, we have a quite a unified approach because they were based on the 1989 resolution. Now, you've seen other resolutions from, from conventions before, and pretty much I thought, okay, well, this is like, you know, half a page long, you know, there's a bunch of whereas is, and it says, okay, districts can certify deacons if they want to. Uh, the resolution is five pages long, single-spaced. It's very definite about how to go about training, certifying, placing in office deacons, and overseeing them. It's very, very specific, and it specifically says that districts can credential deacons to preach, uh, to baptize, and lead the Lord's Supper. That's something else that I forgot. At any rate, uh, the resolution is quite specific, and so each of the districts who do this model ourselves on this resolution. And so the National Convention basically gave us the details and we're executing it in that way. So there's actually more order, more uniformity in Synod as a result of the districts doing what we're doing uh, rather than less. We have the same format. 
Okay, the, uh, the report also says we need to fix this problem of, um, clear, of having non-clergy uh, leading worship services. Okay, so they want to make it easier for deacons like you to become ordained, to enter the colloquy process. Okay, so I'd like a show of hands and see how many of you qualify for the easy road into ordination. This is the quick and easy, the broad way, the broader way. Okay, raise your hand if you are currently a licensed deacon and you're over 54 years old and you've preached twice a month in your church for the last two years. That's 50 times in the last two years. Okay, so I count four of you. This is on the fast track. And our district is, uh, compared to other districts, you know, has a lot of preaching deacons. And so, uh, if they're going to find people for the Calvary program, it's going to start first from us. So really, the Broadway is not very broad. And it's very temporary. This window closes on January 1st of 2018. So that's two years away. After that, um, any deacon who would want to be, or anyone who would want to be uh, preaching in a church would have to go through the full SMP process, special ministry pastor. Uh, that's a four-year program that uh, takes at least $37,000 of tuition, uh, 17 courses, and uh, several trips to the seminary and back, and uh, other courses as well. Uh, so mo most people in most churches find that to be undoable. So uh, certainly the district, or the city from an administrative standpoint, sees this as opening the doors wide. But realistically, there's not much of a wide open door in this report. What the task force recommends would reverse what's been happening in the Senate since 1989. Um, it would mean that all the districts not only who train deacons, but all those who have deacons. Remember, there's 27 districts out there who have preaching deacons. Um, all of that would be terminated. So uh, there's literally hundreds of congregations and deacons who could no longer serve or be served in that way. You know, this is about 26 years that we've been doing this, and it's been accumulating as time goes on. The, uh, this would really cause a great deal of upheaval uh, as this uh, is constricted. Now, I've seen this happening on the local level. Um, some of the people who went to my deacon classes have been deacons for 12 years. And pastors have come and gone while they've been in their churches. The deacons have a longer tenure in churches than the pastors do. And so what happens is, at the ch pastor changeover, there's a changeover in attitude towards the deacons. And so what a good number of uh, men find is that uh, when they start the program and are initially commissioned or ordained, you know, the, they're given a, a good deal of freedom in that ministry. And then another pastor comes in ah! and restricts things more than a little bit. And this really quashes the ministry and quashes the person who generally feels biblically called by God to do this kind of ministry. And in some cases, there's been a changeover of one, two, three, or four pastors in a row. So uh, there already is upheaval happening on the micro level. And so if the National Synod were to terminate deacons, you know, this is, would cause a massive upheaval in the congregations in which they serve and with the pastors that they serve with in, in the cases where that is. Um, and this is a really sad thing, that ministry can be so easily stifled by so few. Another observation about the report, it really doesn't offer an ongoing solution to the challenge of having um, pastors, especially in uh, small, remote, or ethnic, or poor congregations, places in which deacons often serve, uh, on their own or under uh, uh, direct uh, uh, or along with the pastor. The fix the task force has is really quite temporary. It let, lets in just a few deacons who happen to qualify uh, in the three ways that I mentioned before. Um, 
Uh, the other fixes that are in the report really are things that have always existed, like multi-ploy parishes, streaming, and so forth, and really hasn't uh, sufficiently done the job. Now, the thing the report doesn't mention, you hear this all the time in pastor's meetings, okay, but you don't hear this from the task force that opposes deacons, is that up the road of poet peace, there's going to be a shortage of pastors <clears throat> when guys like me retire. You know, there was a certain glut when I entered the ministry, and the certain glut is going to leave the ministry at the same time. Uh, this is common knowledge. And at the same time, our churches are shrinking. As our membership of the synod shrinks, so many of our churches shrink, especially ones in changing neighborhoods. And so that means there will be fewer clergy available, and, and clergy available will not, frankly, want to serve in places where they can't be paid full time. This is the dirty secret among clergy, is we like to be paid full time. <laughs> and so this means there'll be more need for deacons in the future, not less need for that. So the task force doesn't answer the problem, and the problem uh, will grow as time goes on. Another thing the report says is that uh, people are confused <laughs> because they have trouble distinguishing between deacons and pastors. Do any of you have trouble distinguishing between deacons and pastors? <laughs> My wife says she can walk into a room and in one minute she can pack up, pick out the pastors. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right, right? You can probably do that too. Um, th this is the case, uh, or this, uh, there is some overlap between pastor and deacon, just as there's some overlap between DCE and pastor. Um, but this is part of educating a congregation into what the difference is, um, and it's just a matter of understanding. This isn't, this isn't difficult to do. The report concludes by saying, we dare not suppose that our pastors will be the sole solution. But it does do exactly that. It does say the pastors are the sole solution, and that's why we need to use multi-point parishes and streaming rather than deacons to do it. Um, in terms, of, at least, of leading uh, worship, uh, it says pastors are the sole solution. But interesting that the task force, again, never says, we well, you know, part of the solution might actually be biblical deacons. And never even floats that idea that that could be part of the solution. And so that's rather disappointing. People who oppose deacons who preach, especially, often refer to Acts uh, 6, in which the seven are chosen, and they're initially uh, answering the problem of, you know, the Jewish and the Grecian widows uh, being overlooked in the uh, daily distribution, as a way of saying that, uh, of course, deacons are just, uh, you know, potluck-type people. Uh, and then you see what Philip, for instance, did. Philip did miracles, uh, with God's help, of course. He baptized. Acts 8 says he preached the things of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And people came to the Lord in quantity. They said, we want to worship together. And he said, ah, oh, crud, I haven't, been, I haven't been ordained to the office of preaching. <laughs> Sorry. Does <Yeah. laughs> that fit? Does that fit with the guy who was baptized to preach the king, things of the kingdom and uh, thrown out evil spirits? I don't think so. Now, one thing I noticed as I was studying this is how common this office of deacon is across the entire Christian world. Now, there are different names for this, but it's the same office from denomination to denomination. The Baptists call them licensed ministers. The Methodists call them local pastors. The Presbyterians call them ruling elders. The Episcopalians have perpetual deacons. <laughs> Roman Catholics, permanent deacons. Pentecostals call them licensed preachers. Nazarenes call them local or district ministers. Calvary Chapel calls them assisting pastors. We call them deacons. The thing is, though, it's the same office if you look at how they structure them. Uh, for instance, um, they all have the same characteristics that we do. 
Namely, these men do pastoral work with a pastor or alone, depending on the circumstance. They have training, some kind of licensing after training, after they fit qualifications, biblical ones, mainly about character, and uh, after they're interviewed. Uh, they preach, they do pastoral uh, activities, they usually baptize, usually uh, consecrate the Lord's Supper. They do this under supervision, usually from a local pastor or from a denominational uh, officer. And if they're alone, they do these things uh, by themselves. Uh, what's, what's striking to me is, this is very grassroots. It's in every kind of polity. It's in every kind of theology. It comes from the bottom up. And so what this tells me is, number one, uh, Christians need this kind of ministry, regardless of what denomination you're identifying with. And secondly, it tells me that the Holy Spirit is at work doing this, giving deacons or whatever title we have for them as the answer to those needs. And that's a, a way we can learn from or, or see the God at work in other places beyond our own as well. Now the wider church has been responsive to deacons in several ways. And I mentioned to you the numbers of different uh, auxiliary offices. You can see there are 525 licensed deacons, 331 who preach. There's only 11 parish assistants, that's an official auxiliary office in the Senate. Only 21 directors of outreach, only 25 directors of family ministry, only 61 directors of parish music, only 161 deaconesses, 169 SMPs, 627 uh, Christian uh, uh, DCDs. Uh, and each of these auxiliary offices are not biblical offices. Uh, you'll be real stretched to find, uh, you know, parish assistant or director of outreach in uh, the New Testament as an ordained office. And yet deacon is. Um, and the amazing growth in 26 years really is stri striking when you think about it. Uh, reminds me of Gamaliel's words, you know, leave these men alone, uh, otherwise you'll find yourself uh, fighting against God. So the, 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 the Senate has uh, accepted uh, very quickly uh, deacons because it is a biblical office. Just a few side comments about the Augsburg Confession. Um, it does talk about the proper call. And as I mentioned before, the three basic parts of the proper call, you know, training, uh, qualifications, interview, uh, ordination of some sort, uh, also are the kinds of things uh, that really make deacon uh, a legitimate biblical office. Now the Lutheran confessions don't describe what a deacon should do, and so some people think, well, if the confessions mention deacons but don't describe what they do, then we shouldn't have it. So should we not do or not address things that aren't in the Lutheran confessions? Are the individual parts of the divine service in the Lutheran Confessions? No. Um, does the Lutheran Confessions define sprinkling as opposed to dunking? And we'll talk about this. You know, the Confessions are basically written to the needs of their day. And so I don't think the Confessions were written with a view to uh, prohibiting anything that isn't mentioned in them. And so we need to uh, take that into account. Uh, it's hard to find a real good discussion of dispensationalism and the rapture in the Confessions, for instance, because uh, it wasn't an issue then. One of the best things about the Task Force report is the footnotes, uh, which I think was kind of cool. The good stuff's in there. The footnotes do mention that uh, the Office of Deacon is uh, in the Bible, mentioned in 2 Timothy 3. That's in the small print. The small print mentions that in the Reformation area there were deacons, and they were not considered laymen, and they were or considered ordained clergy, but of a lower rank than ordinary clergy. The small print mentions that Luther and Walther both mention laymen preaching in an affirmative way, a complimentary way. It's interesting that the report uh, never actually uh, quotes 1 Timothy 3 about qualifications for a deacon, except they happen to quote somebody else who quotes uh, 1 Timothy, so that's a nice plus. 
And in the small print of the port, it mentions that there's 27 districts that have uh, licensed deacons doing uh, word or word and sacrament ministry. Okay, so that's the, the descriptions or the recommendations in the Aspos report. That's termination. Okay, I'd like to suggest some other recommendations. These are just mine, so I'll take them for what they're worth. One is one thing we can do is explain how lay leadership training and how certified deacons do fulfill the synod intent and the synod need to have orderly ministry in many locations. Uh, especially places where people that don't have contact with deacons don't have much of a sense of how that works or how it really is fulfilling the intent of a decision made by the synod at large. I think we should also enlarge rather than hinder ministry. Um, and unfortunately, we pastors can be real bottlenecks in this uh, restricting and hindering ministry. I guess I'm a little different uh, than many pastors in that uh, I was certified as a Lutheran teacher, I have my LTD, and I was certified as a director of Christian education, so I have a DCE certification, which means I went through that training and those apprenticeships, right? And one thing I found out is that the auxiliary offices in the Synod, Lutheran teachers, DCEs, etc., have a rather mixed view of us clergy. <laughs> Uh, they see that many of us clergy are prideful. One guy said, you know, do they teach Arrogance 101 in the seminary? <laughs> now that's an over the top way to put it, but uh, we're known for being prideful. We're known for wanting to control things. Uh, we're known for protecting our turf. Now, uh, many of us work against that and some of us don't do that much, okay? But these are some of the things we're known for and our congregations are too nice to tell us about that, unless it gets out of hand, and then they hammer us, right? But on the whole, our congregations are real nice to us, nicer than maybe we deserve. Um, these auxiliary offices recognize that pastors often confuse uh, their opinions with God's commands. But a lot of pastors confuse our preferences with theology. Um, then we come out of seminary in our 20s, and I was one of those guys, you know, uh, strong on education and weak on wisdom. And so a lot of the deacons have a lot, fit better the qualifications for office than the pastors coming out of seminary do. And so we as pastors need to, uh, yes, we have oversight, but to uh, release uh, uh, people to minister in our churches and uh, deacons especially in that way. Remember, the Apostle John criticized one guy who was throwing out demons because he wasn't one of them. And Jesus said, don't stop him. You know, uh, Paul said about Phoebe, uh, receive her in the Lord and give her any help she may need. You know, we, did, we need to be gas pedals for ministry, not, not brakes on the ministry. Uh, most of us, clergy especially, but also you as deacons need to do that. Some other recommendations. You know, we need to really concentrate on teaching the biblical approach to deacons rather than the administrative or the historical approach. And we need to be able to distinguish between the two, which is, just seems to be hard for some people to do, you know? And that means using the right terms, you know? And, and lay deacon is not a biblical term. We need to think and teach biblically rather than historically or administratively. Um, and as you certainly understood, you know, we need to reject the task force's recommendations. You know, uh, they're well-meaning people, uh, certainly honest people, want to do but the best by Senate, I believe. But I also believe the recommendations, you know, in a lot of ways are, are counter uh, to what's in the New Testament. And so it's good that we, rec uh, we turn those down. And as a part of that, that we encourage our delegates to the convention next year, uh, to turn down the recommendations that are in the task force report. And it's appropriate to make deacon an office in the Senate or an auxiliary office in the Senate because this is a, a biblical office. The other auxiliary offices, you know, I credit those people as good and good ministers, okay? But they are not biblical offices. And deacon is a biblical office. How come there's room for auxiliary offices that are not biblical offices but not room for deacon that is? Does this make sense to you? Now, there is a kind of levels of ordination already in the Senate. 
you know, there are uh, Bonafide clergy, uh, then there are also SMP, special ministry pastors, uh, who have a little bit more restrictions as far as what they can do. Uh, if we were to uh, introduce a uh, deacon as an auxiliary office or a regular office, then it would probably be in that uh, sense of uh, uh, being uh, an ordination in the sense of playing a placing an office, but into a different office uh, than pastor or clergy is. Those are my thoughts, my observations. And uh, you're welcome to take uh, home the written report that you probably received on the way in, and that's pretty much as uh, what I presented to you uh, this morning. And if you uh, have any questions or things to add to that, you know, do that today or send me an email sometime.